Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 15, Luke 15. It's been over 11 years since we've looked in detail at this passage. I was kind of surprised. Luke chapter 15, we're actually going to start in verse 11. Uh, this is commonly known as the prodigal, or excuse me, the parable of the prodigal, the prodigal of the parable son. No, this is the parable of the prodigal son. It could just as easily have been titled uh, the parable of the loving father. Uh, one writer suggests that it would be more properly called a parable of two sons. Um, I think it's proper to emphasize uh, the uh, younger of the two sons because most of the story is really about him. If we were to kind of boil this story down, we would come down to probably this. A man had two sons. The younger demanded his portion of the inheritance and left home. In time, he wasted it all and wound up deep in poverty. He repented. He returned to the father who was looking for his return and who welcomed him home with great joy and celebration. He returned not as a servant, but he returned as the father's son. We could summarize it even more. Younger son rebels, experienced the consequences of that rebellion, returns home and is graciously received by a loving father. I think the emphasis is probably upon, first of all, the rebellion of the son, which highlights the love of the father. And I think the, the elder brother really is at least a, a secondary aspect in the story, although some insist that, that uh, that's a big part of the story. It does tell us, as it begins, a certain man had two sons. So, so all of those are covered in that. Uh, this is a classic story of rebellion, repentance, and restoration. Luke was said by some of the ancient writers, in addition to being a, a physician and historian, some say that he was an artist as well, a painter. Um, if that is true, certainly his portrait of the three lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, could give no better picture of the grace and love of God our Father. The chapter begins, if you look at verse 1, uh, actually, look at verse 3. It begins with a parable of a hundred sheep and losing one. It then, in verse 8, goes to a woman uh, with um, ten pieces of silver, and then she loses one, sweeps the whole house, and, and finds it. Uh, the value as well as the percentage increases. The sheep was one of a hundred. A silver coin is more valuable than a sheep, but not only that, the percentage increased because it was one of ten. And then we get to the sun, and who can put the price on the value of a sun? There, there is no price. We would give everything that we have. We would give our lives for, for our child. And the sun is lost, one of two. Uh, so it builds in significance. Uh, the sheep and the coin are lost inadvertently. The sheep, because it's the tendency of sheep to stray. The coin, because it's the tendency of coins to roll under the dresser. Uh, if you don't believe me, drop one on the floor and see where it goes. Uh, so that's just the natural tendency. Both of those were found through a diligent search. Went out and found the sheep, carried him home, on, put him on his shoulders and carried him home. Searched the house, lit the candle, got out the flashlight, searched under the bed, swept everything. Uh, have you ever noticed how you find things when you're cleaning up? I don't notice that very much, but those of you, some of you might notice that. Uh, but in reality, in reality, my wife is a needy. I'm, what, what's the book that you have on keeping these neat? What's it called me? A messy, yes. Um, so in any case, uh, they found them. Cleaned up, found them. I guess that's a good, good reason for losing things that you need is because you have to clean up maybe to find them if they're important enough. But the son left of his own free will. And although the father could have sought him out, he could never have returned the son to his heart. The only way for the son to return was to return of his own free will the same way that he, wait, same way that he left. One more thing I want us to note before we get to the, to the heart of the parable here is to whom was Jesus speaking? Look in verse 1, Luke 15, 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners. So that's the first, first people he's speaking to. The publicans and sinners, they drew near. 
And then it says, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured. Murmur is it's, it's, a, it's an onomatopoetic word. We talked about that. Um, the idea of murmur is you can't understand it, and so it sounds like murmur, 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 like that. It's an onomatopoeic word. Uh, the sound, like bees go bzzz. Uh, what is it? Um, zippers go zip. Uh, jets go whoosh. It's, an, it's the sound. And so the murmur, that's the idea. You, you hear something, but you can't distinguish it, so it's, it's one of those words. They murmured. Why did they murmur? They were upset because Jesus received two. Look at what it says. Then the, the, the Pharisees scribe murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You recall one of the things that Peter was criticized for in uh, Acts chapter 11 after he'd returned from the household of Cornelius? He went down to the Gentiles and ate with them. The uh, Arabic saying is to, to eat salt with a man is, is to share with him as a brother. That's the idea, the phrase to eat salt. And so to dine together was a big thing. Now, it says he receiveth, receives him, but the word is intensified there. Um, and not only that, there are a couple of words for receive. And this word means that he received him, received them, not simply that he allowed them, but rather that he welcomed them. The Holman translation has this. Pharisees and scribes were complaining, and here's what they said. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus welcomed them as his friends. It was not proper for upright citizens to have close dealings with the lower classes of people, particularly the righteous with the unrighteous, and that was the big issue there. Uh, these publicans and sinners were viewed as the social outcasts by the, pub, by the, by the, not the Republicans, but by the, by the um, uh, Pharisees and the uh, scribes it mentions there, but the Sadducees would have seen them the same way. So they says he, he welcomes them. Jesus never denies this charge. Jesus never says, no, 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 I don't receive them. In fact, the opposite is true. Jesus did not simply receive them. He came here looking for them. Luke 19, 10, Matthew 18, 11, the words are identical in those two verses. Here's what they say. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to seek them out. Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He simply didn't come to look for them and to seek them. He came to die for them. Matthew 9, 12, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. See, the, the Jews were all big on going through their rituals. This is what we do. This is how we do it. You got to do it the certain way at the right time. And Jesus says more than that is mercy, compassion. Matthew 9, 13 goes on. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why would Jesus come to seek and to save that which was lost? These three parables give the reason for that. They're lost and they have value. The sheep has value. The coin has value. But infinitely above that, the son has value. And so Jesus seeks them because he came to find them. Interesting, in all three parables, when the shepherd comes back with the lost sheep, when the woman finds the coin, when the lost son returns, the neighbors, the family, they all rejoice. Is that the response of the Pharisees and the scribes? No. Not only do they fail to rejoice in the finding or the return of the lost souls, they even criticize Jesus for looking. They're not happy with the fact that Jesus has sought them out. The Pharisees, at, at a basic core level, have failed to understand that there is a vast gulf between their view of their own righteousness and God's view of their righteousness. See, they thought they were okay. They weren't. And they did not grasp that. They thought they were righteous. Were they? Hardly. We need to understand today that any righteousness that is in us is not of us. 
any righteousness that may be in us is because of the cross. And it's because of God's grace and it's because of what God does. There is nothing in us. And if we properly grasp that, that will dramatically impact the way that we look at those who society or even we, certainly the Pharisees, label as sinners. Understanding that it's by grace. And we have no right to stand in his presence other than the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so... That's who it's to. I think the focus is both upon the sinners that they're welcome and upon the Pharisees. Shame on you for not welcoming them. The Pharisees and the scribes. Now, as we come to this, it says, certain man had two sons. Look at the text. Verse 11, certain man had two sons. Verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. The word living there, interesting. You know, we think that when you think of the inheritance, it's all about the stuff. But it's more than that because this is what the father had accumulated. This is what the father had poured his life into. And it was, in essence, all of this was not simply the stuff, but it was the father's life. So it's easy to divide it unto them his living. Guess what the word is there? It's the word bios. You know what word we get from that? Biology. Biology is the study of life. So he divides to his sons his very life. That's an interesting statement. Now, we're not told why the son demanded the inheritance, but he left. Soon after that, he took what he had and he left. He went to his far country, into a far country, and he lived a wild life. We're not told, again, why he left, but I think it's reasonable to assume there was probably some tension between perhaps father and son. Perhaps the two brothers. There was likely some kind of uncertainty. Guess who's not mentioned? We have the father. We have the two brothers. Guess who we don't have? There's no mention of the mother. The mother may have passed away. It's true in most families that mother and father are different. How many of y'all are built on different thermostats? Who's comfortable right now? I'm a little bit warm. Everybody warm? We're all on the same thermostat. All right, we'll get with someone and get that looked at this week. Apologize for that. I've been on vacation where it was hot. Actually, this is cool compared to where we've been. So in any case, um, God puts together people oftentimes who have opposite thermostats. One's cold, one's hot, one wants the fan, one wants covers. All right. And in families, mothers and fathers tend to balance each other out. It may be, and we're not told this, but it may be that the balance was out of balance because the mother was gone from the story. We don't know that. Nothing in the text indicates that the father was only overly strict. What the text indicates is that the younger son wanted out. It's probable that it was rebellion. Look down to verse 29. After the son comes back, what's the brother say? He answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time my commandment. What's the suggestion? My younger brother transgressed the commandment, your commandments. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. As soon as this thy son was come, verse 30, look what he adds now, which hath devoured thy life, your livelihood, which you built, he's devoured it with harlots, wild women. Now that's the brother's assessment. Now we have to, understand that that is simply what the brother says. What the brother thinks about the other brother may or may not have been true. But that's his assessment. Scripture accurately and faithfully records what the older brother said. But the father doesn't correct him. It's likely that it was, he was rebellious. He was a rebellious, rebellious child. And so that seems to be suggested there. Ephesians 6.4 says, fathers and ye fathers, provoke not your sons to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Again, there's nothing in the context to indicate that this has happened, but some have done that. By being overly strict, they breed rebellion. Legalism, overly strict, legalism, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, often breeds rebellion. That doesn't mean that there should not be rules. Rules are fine, but if they're overly strict, then it tends to breed rebellion. Now, the younger son demands the inheritance. 
He says, divide it. Give me my share. What would his share have been? How many brothers? Two brothers. It would have been divided because there were two brothers. It would have been divided into three parts. I know that's kind of flaky math here. But the reason is that the oldest brother always got a double portion. The oldest brother got a double portion, got a double share. So the younger brother, in essence, says, give me my third of the stuff now. Now, was the father going to sell his house? No. So what he probably had to do is liquidate what assets were available and give him what he could. The younger son probably received less, maybe even significantly less, than a third of his father's wealth. However, his demand was that the father give him, the father was not required to do that. The father would distribute the inheritance at a time of his own choosing. Today, we get the inheritance after they... You ever notice on the back of cars, and I see this a lot, on the back of a car, they've got the little stick-on letters, in memory of so-and-so. I always wonder if they bought that with the insurance money, and that's what they were saying. I don't know. Does anybody know what that is? Maybe, maybe they're just honoring their brother or sister or mother or father or whatever it is. But to me, it almost, it almost you know, seems a little bit like the former. Maybe I have a bad thought on that, a bad perspective. But in any case, uh, they had that a lot. Um, normally, the inheritance today is divided at death. Normally, here it would have been gradually passed and transitioned into the ownership of the older brother who would manage it and he would be trained. I think we've made a mistake in our culture today in that we wait till we die to teach our kids to manage stuff. I think that the proper way would be to gradually shift things to them knowing that they're going to be stupid at some points. I always, that's probably not a good sophisticated word, is it? But it's true. I always try to, you know, when we go on vacation, give the kids a dollar. That's about all we could give them. But we try to give them a dollar, let them spend it any way they wanted to. Because they need to learn that you can spend it however you want, but you can only spend it once. If you buy this little trinket, you can't buy the next little trinket. So it's important to look at all the trinkets and decide which one you want. So I think the idea of teaching children responsibility with the wealth with which God has entrusted us is a key factor of parents. In fact, the main job of parents in raising kids is to teach them to fly and kick them out of the nest. I'm not trying to sound harsh, but if your kids are 35 years old and still living at home, getting an allowance, and you're supporting them, there's something wrong with that picture. Do we, we understand that, right? Okay, so the, the key point is to kick him, but, but not to do that at the wrong time. Here this young man says, I want out, I want free now. Philip Keller, in his, excuse me, Tim Keller, in his excellent book titled The Prodigal God, has this to say about the son demanding his inheritance. Here's what he says. The original listeners would have been amazed by such a request. Not that there was anything amiss in the son's expectation of a share of the family wealth. However, this division of estate only occurred, I would correct and say normally occurred, when the father died, the complete division. Back to the quote. Here, the younger son asked for his inheritance now, which was a sign of deep disrespect. To ask this while the father still lived was the same as to wish him dead. The younger son was saying essentially that he wants his father's things, but not his father. Wow, think about that. Think about the impact of that to the dad, to the culture. The younger son soon takes it all, travels to a far country, and he squanders his inheritance. Look at verse 13. It says, he wasted his substance with riotous living. That's a word that only occurs a couple of times. In fact, I think the verb form, um, a sotos, only occurs here. The online Bible lexicon gives this definition. You have it in your notes. Here's what it says. It has the idea of reckless and extravagant expenditure, chiefly for the gratification of one's 
sensual desires. And the word prodigal comes from this. The English word, pro, we think of the word prodigal, we think of wild and rebellious and stubborn and wicked and sinful. That's not the essence of it. The essence of prodigal is wasteful. That's the essence of prodigal. Wasteful. Extravagantly lavishing things wastefully without regard for the idea of, of saving things. That's the essence of the word. Now, the son sought freedom from his family, and he got freedom. But he wound up a slave to his passions. And the poverty, a slave to his passions, a slave to the poverty that resulted as his, from his lack of restraint. Understand this, and I always try to teach the kids this. You tell your children, don't touch the oven door, it's... But I would suggest to you that if your child reaches out to touch the oven door, let them. They need to understand that the warnings that you give them have significance. They need to understand that you've been there and therefore you can spare them some pain. Now, touching an oven door may be a little bit painful, but it's not going to leave scars. You might say, oh, don't touch the red glowing eye of the burner. And I would suggest that if they try to do that, you not let them. Because that could be such a serious burn that could leave serious scars. If you want to let them get close, let them get close and feel the heat. But some kids have to do it themselves. They, they, so give them some room to do that. If you don't give them some room and some freedom to do that, then when they do get the freedom, they'll go wild with it. And so it's essential. So in any case, the, the, the young man chooses his course freely. Although we may freely choose what we do, once we have made a decision, the consequences of that choice are often beyond our control. You can feel bad and decide to jump off a bridge. You can stand on the bridge all day. But once you execute based on that decision, the circumstances are under the control of gravity. And this young man's decision to leave and to waste it, the consequences of that were beyond his control once he got to that point. So he gathered all, went to a far country, wasted his substance. Verse 14 says, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country sent, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, feed pigs. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the pigs ate. And no man gave unto him. Now, I've heard this, and I've heard people say, that's God's judgment right there. He rebelled and God judged him. Now, I do understand that God does judge his children when we disobey. I understand that. But I don't think that's so much the focus here. Certainly the father is providential in the timing of these events. But the reality is, whether you saved or not, guess what's going to happen in the world? There arose a mighty... Famine. There will be famines. It's a part of life. I think to some degree he's experienced simply, simply a natural consequence of his stubbornness and rebellion. If there arose a famine and he had managed his money wisely, do you think he'd have been feeding the pigs? But blowing his money was, in essence, a part of who he was and his rebellion. And so, all gone, all gone. And so, so there he is feeding the pigs. Interesting thought. Those who seek freedom from God wind up as slaves to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Satan is a very hard taskmaster. And his wages are high. In fact, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, in any case, um, think about this. The same son that softens wax, hardens clay. It depends on what the heart is. Do we understand that? And the young man had to reach a point where his heart was broken. The hardness of the clay was broken and the softness was exposed. Even though his actions denied the likeness of the father, his likeness to the father, the circumstances of life that came as a result of his rebellion caused him to do what? To return home. Because home was still home. 2 Peter 2.22, you don't need to turn to it. The references there, I'll read it to you. Here's what it says. 
2 Peter 2.22. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You can take a pig, clean it up. We referred to this a couple weeks ago on Wednesday night. You can take a pig, you can wash it up, you can tie a bow around its neck, you can spray perfume on it, you can put him at a table, give him a plate, name him Arnold, and he's still a pig. He's a pig. The pig is ever a pig, never a son. Bathing a pig will not change its nature. The son, even though he's living with the pigs, had been washed in the dirt, they ripped the bow off his neck, put slime all around him, smelled like the pigs, living with the pigs, and he'd already been acting like the pigs. All right. Eating with the pigs, but guess what? I will, he came to his own senses and he says, I will arise and I will go to my father. You know why he could say that? Because he wasn't a pig. Understand this. Someone who is a believer can live with the pigs, but if they're a believer, they're a son. I think that's one of the classic lessons of the story that is often missed. In fact, as much as I like Tim Keller's book, he misses that. He says they were both lost. No, the son wasn't lost. He was always a son. He was never a pig. He was ever a son. On contrary, the pig was ever a pig, never a son. So, the son is a son. You know, we have people who will visit because they're at the bottom of the barrel. We may have the attitude, well, they're at the bottom of the barrel. Do we want them? Think about this. It may be that God put them at the bottom of the barrel so they could come and find out what the love of God is all about. Think of our response to sinners from the lesson of this and from the Pharisees and how Jesus responds to them. Luke 15, 17 says this. When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father, look at verse 17, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish, I'm about to starve to death. I will arise, go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. That's a good starting point, huh? I messed up. There are people in life who cannot say those words. It, is, it would kill them to say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. You want to know the most basic element of maintaining relationships? All relationships have problems. We're going to mess up, okay? The most fundamental element in maintaining relationships is the ability to say, I messed up. I was wrong. Please forgive me. But I only did it because you did this first. No. You ever got an apology like that? I did it, but it's really your fault. Or it's somebody else's fault. No. In fact, don't give an apology too quick. Sometimes an apology too quick simply means, okay, you caught me, I'm sorry. When people give apology, you, you got to listen to the heart when people give an apology. Are they apologizing from the heart or are they apologizing from the head? Yeah, I know I'm supposed to say this. And my suggestion is, until your heart's in the right place, don't give an apology. Until you're grieved over hurting your brother, until you're grieved over hurting a child, until you're grieved over hurting a friend, don't give a flip apology. That's not in the notes. That's, that's extra. Okay? So, in any case, I have sinned against heaven before thee. Incidentally, the first sin is against God. Sin is always against God. David, after he had murdered Uriah, after he, get an order here, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, after he had tried to cover it up, after he had commanded his commanders to get in battle and leave Uriah in the middle and withdraw that he die, after he killed Uriah, he still doesn't acknowledge it. The prophet comes in and says, you're the man. You're the man. Thou art the man. Nathan shakes his bony finger in his face. Thou art the man. That's never fun. Let me just tell you this. If you ever come to someone and say, thou art the man, you better be sure you have the message from God and not from your own pride. 
because there's a way to correct people. And that's in a spirit of love and humility. Restore them in a spirit of meekness, Galatians 6 says. That's how we correct people. If you can't do it that way, don't do it. Okay? In any case, uh, so, so he, he says, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Understand this. Who here is worthy to be called a son? Not one of us. But the Pharisees thought, oh, Abraham's our father. We are worthy, they thought. They didn't understand it. They did not understand it. We need to get that, that our worthiness is not because of us. Our worthiness is because of God's grace and the price that was paid on Calvary. That's the only worthiness we have because of God, God's love for us. Now, he was from a well-to-do family. They didn't just have a servant. They had servants, hired servants. That his father was a compassionate man was indicated by the son's expectation that he would come home and his dad would at least give him a job. I messed up real bad. I took the inheritance. I blew it. I offended you. I insulted you publicly in the community when I left that way. And it was a, a source of humiliation. And I'm sorry. And, but he had confidence that his father's love would at least give him a job. That kind of attitude is necessary if you're going to find forgiveness and mercy and restoration. And so he goes home to seek these. Now, let's look at his speech. I want to, I want to give that because he prepares his speech. Verse 18 and 19. This is not in your notes. Look at it. 15, 18 and 19. I will arise, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned before thee, sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You see the whole speech? I've sinned. I'm not worthy to be a son. Make me a slave. Make me your servant. That's the speech. Okay? All right. Verse 20. He arose came to his father. That, and that's important too. After you decide what you're going to do to make it right, get up and make it right. We sometimes decide, yeah, I need to do something about this and we never do it. I recall hearing, a, hearing a someone who, who, who loved, uh, loved biscuits and he heard of this lady who was making biscuits and she was known for making great biscuits. And while the biscuits were cooking, someone jumped in the house and they fell. And the, do biscuits do that? I don't know what it was. But anyhow, they, they, any, uh, so the biscuits were not that great. They were not all big and fluffy. They were kind of short and thick and heavy. And he took a bite of those biscuits and he says, what happened, Mamie? You make the best biscuits in the world. And he said, he said well, so, she said, well, sir, them biscuits was a squat and a rise and they got cooked in the squat. If we know we need to do something and we're squatting to rise, we need to make sure we don't get cooked in the squat. And so he says he's going to do it, and he does it. He goes to his father. Look at this. Look at his father. His father was offended. His father was wronged. But yet his father is looking for him. His father not only saw him, verse 20, it says, that he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off. Get the picture of this. The dad sitting there, perhaps every morning, perhaps every evening, sitting on the porch, rocking in the rocking chair, eating his biscuits with jelly and honey and butter. You got to have imagination when you read scripture, okay? He's sitting there and he's looking down the road. Maybe this will be the day. Maybe this will be the day that my son will come home. And he has that longing, that expectation for his son, the desire, the brokenness for the restored relationship. Maybe this will be the day. And he's watching and he sees in the distance down the road a speck. And he sees him walking and getting closer and getting, maybe that's my son. And as he gets closer, you know, he kind of walks like my son. And as he gets closer and closer, he recognizes him. He jumps off the porch and he runs to his son. And he welcomes him home. Get the, get the speech here. The son says, verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. What part did he leave out? He didn't get to the part about the servant. You know why? Because the dad's covering him with kisses. It says the father said to his servants, actually it says he fell on his neck and kissed him. We, we think of kiss. The word, the word there is not simply kissed. It's the word phileo, to love. The father loved him, but it's kata phileo. It's intensified. Intensified kisses. 
The father kept on loving him and loving him and loving him. And so he doesn't even get to the rest of it. Father says to the servants, before he gets to make me a say, he said, bring hither, bring the best robe, put it on him. Interesting, what kind of robe? Go get one, that, go, not, go get one of the old robes. He's really messed up and he needs to wear one of the old robes for a while. I've heard people say, well, if a bride is pregnant, she shouldn't wear white. The reality is, none of us have any right to wear white. Let the white stand for not our own righteousness. Let it stand for the forgiving and cleansing power of Jesus Christ. The best robe, not the old dirty one, not the one that's been hanging in the closet since he left, got dust and moth eaten and all that kind of stuff. Bring the best robe and put on him. Nothing less than the best because he is still a son. He's not a servant. He's a son. And a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Verse 23, bring hither the fatted calf. What's a, fa what's a fatted calf? I like that. The fat, does that sound good? What are we going to have for dinner this afternoon? Oh, go get the fatted calf. It's, it's like, the, like the rich man. It's we are going to fare sumptuously. Amen? You ever notice how much the Bible, I notice how much the Bible talks about food. Maybe it doesn't talk about it as much, but I sure notice it. So he says, bring the fatted calf. If you have a fatted calf, what's that mean? Okay, but, but, but if he has been fattened, how did that happen? By accident? No, they fattened him up. We don't know how long the son was gone. This might have been the third or fourth or the fifth or the tenth fatted calf. But the point is, the dad always had a fatted calf waiting for the son's return. That should be our response when people come into the family, people come and visit. Our response should be, whoa, we're glad to have you. This is food day. Help us eat the fatted calf. Amen? That, that ought to be our mindset. We ought to rejoice. Father did not require the son to grovel at his feet. In fact, he didn't allow any groveling. When someone hurts us, I think there's a tendency to, to want that. You got to cry more before I'm going to forgive you. Kel, again, Keller writes. Keller has some great stuff in his book. Here's what, he, here's what he says here. The younger brother, and that is in his request, then is asking the father to tear his life apart by giving him the inheritance then. And the father does so for the love of his son. Most of Jesus' listeners would never have seen a Middle Eastern patriarch respond like this. Are you all aware of uh, Islamic honor killings? Yes. We hear about it. Uh, uh, and it's all, it seems like it's always the girl. The girl goes off and dates someone who's not an Islam. And what do the brothers feel they have a right to do because she has disgraced the family name, the father's name? Kill her. That is the culture. And yet this man, when his son said, I wish you were dead, give me my stuff. You're not dying quick enough for me. Give me my stuff, I'm out of here. This man responds differently. Continuing with Keller, the father patiently endures. You don't have this in your notes. This is in my notes. The father patiently endures a tremendous loss of honor as well as the pain of rejected love. Ordinarily, when our love is rejected, we get angry, we retaliate, and we do what we can to diminish our love for the rejecting person so we won't hurt so much. See, if we push them away, it doesn't hurt as much because they're not as close. So he won't hurt so much. But this father maintains his affection for his son and bears the agony. Wow. So, father's overjoyed at the return of the son. Starts the party even before all the guests gets there. He starts the party even before the older brother gets there. Older brother's out in the field. He hears all this going on. And I think if we were to say he was less than pleased, would be an understatement. It's like saying King Kong's a fair-sized chimp. Titanic's a decent rowboat. Okay, it says he was not happy with the celebration. He was angry to see the father make such a big deal over his brother's return. In fact, the father had to come and beg him to come to the party. Verse 28, look what it says. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and entreated him. He begged him to come in. He answering said, lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither, we, we've read that already. 
he makes a double accusation. Number one, against the brother for being a slut chasing, skirt chasing, waster of his father's life, livelihood. And then he also is accusing the father. This son of yours, notice he didn't even call him brother. He didn't even say my brother. He almost, he disowns him. The, the older brother disowns him. This, you think we ever do that in the family of God? Someone does something that hurts us and it's like, well, they can't be saved. They'd never do that if they were saved. I've had people hurt me. I've had people do destructive things, disruptive things to the church. And I pretty much share most everything with, with Marty, my friend. And I appreciate his compassion and tenderness for me. And I share it with others as well. And people will say, well, he just proved that he was a snake. He was never a serpent. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I'm always hesitant to do that. Let God make those judgments. Now, when someone does that to him, I say the same thing. <laughs> someone does that to you, that rotten heathen, he's a pagan, he was a liar, he was a wolf from the start. He was never one of God's sheep, you know, because sheep don't bite the shepherd. That's an interesting thought, you know, in any, in any case. Um, so, um, an accusation against that. Thy son, not my brother. The father reminds him. Notice this. Look back at the text. Look to verse um, 31. And he said, son, thou art ever with me. You, you've always been with me. Look at the last part of verse 31. What's it say? All that I have is yours. Understand this. The brother had got his inheritance, the younger brother, and it was gone. He blew it. He wasted it. Wine, women, and wild living. That's the idea. He just, he just went after a party. Party time. He went after all of that. Going to have a good time. It's gone. He comes home. He gets a robe. He gets a ring. He gets shoes. He gets a seat at the table. But the table ultimately belongs to the older brother. Because that's all that's left. It's the older brother's. The father's response was one of joyous welcoming the son. Jesus no doubt told the story to illustrate the love of the heavenly father. That's what he was teaching. This is God's love. This is what God is like. The sheep is lost. The coin is lost. The son is lost. And the love of the father is to restore and to bring back home. The Jews were questioning, why would Jesus spend time with these sinners and not us? They were prideful. And these parables indicate that there's more, rejoice, more rejoicing over sinners who come home than of the righteous who never left. Are the 99 sheep in the fold still sheep? Are they still important? Yeah, yeah. But the one was lost. We get so hung up on the 90 and 9, we forget about the one. We get so hung up on ourselves, we forget about those who need to see and experience and sense the love of God as manifested in the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. And that's this place. That's what we are. That's what we are to do. Our response must be similar in desiring the salvation of lost souls and the restoration of brothers who have strayed. That should be our response. Believers who have strayed from the Father's love are not the enemy. They have been taken captive by the enemy. They're under the influence of the enemy. But we must not strive with them. When Paul writes Timothy, he says, we must be gentle, apt to teach, patience in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In the whole context there, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, he says to Timothy, flee youthful lusts, follow righteousness, faith, charity, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. I just got to tell you, there have been times in my life when I have thoroughly enjoyed debating theology. And I think it's important to keep the axe sharp. I think that's important. And iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the face of his friend, Proverbs says. But we need to be careful that as we sharpen each other that we don't cut each other. And when we are having discussions to keep ourselves sharp theologically and to make sure we're accurate, we need to be careful that they don't turn into malicious debates. It needs to be in love. It needs to be gentle. And if it's not that, withdraw from the debate. So he says, 
all that things, the foolish and unlearned questions, they gender strife. Interesting how much the Bible says about strife. Something that's divisive in the church, something that creates strife in the church. There's going to be that, but don't do that. We've had people come in, and, and I don't, thank God we don't have anybody with us now, but, but I have seen people visit, I've seen people come in, we've had people who are here for a time who thrived on conflict. If there's not some kind of conflict going on, they're not content. Well, so he says, verse 24, and the servant of the Lord, and that would be diakoneo, it's a broad term, the servant of the Lord, must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, and there it's repentance to return, not repentance for salvation, to the acknowledging of the truth. Verse 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. May God grant to us that we might understand, that we might see the self righteous pride of the Pharisees and the scribes and certainly the Sadducees as well. May we see it for what it is. The same thing as our own pride and self-righteousness. When we think, whoa, aren't I somebody? I'm not going to put up with that. The reality is that our position is to be like the Lord Jesus to seek the lost, to draw them in, and to seek the restoration of believers who have fallen by the wayside. And there's a ton of them who have fallen by the wayside. They are taken captive. May we, like the Father, patiently, longingly, with aching hearts, seek the salvation of the lost and the restoration of the prodigals. May we pray. Father, I would ask that we would learn the lesson of this. I would pray that uh, as believers we would see that. I would pray that as fathers we would understand our responsibility to make reconciliation and make restoration. Father, may we also understand that when a son has strayed, he needs to return of his own. We can do what we can as long as they're in the home. May we find the balance there. May we see that. May we know that. And may we always be loving. May we always be responsive to the needs of those around us. May we always be tender to the speaking and leading of your Holy Spirit. And may we always be consistent with your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.